I just want to make it clear that I am not an experienced writer. I have changed the names of the people involved to prevent any issues that there were issues in the past. I've been obsessed with horror and scary movies since I was probably 8 years old. When I was 13, I got heavily into creepypastas and I just wanted to experience true horror for myself in real life. I am now 20 years old and this incident occurred in the summer of 2018. I live in a small and boring town in northern Ontario. People moving here or away from here are rare occurrences and the only thing to do is get drunk and take drugs, of which I do neither, so boredom it is. I had enough of watching videos and movies and decided to head to my local mall to pick up a Ouija board. It was springtime and the snow had just finished melting and we were feeling adventurous. My friend, I'll call him Lenny, Lenny and I split the cost of the board and then took it to his house. Later that night, we head over to our local church and sat on the front steps and tried to contact some spirits. I know, sounds stupid, but we moved the planchette in circles, called out, etc. Nothing. We tried the board for the next few weeks in various locations and settings. Nothing. I was beginning to feel defeated and sort of stupid for actually thinking a board could be used to contact the dead. Fast forward into the summer and I had made a few new friends through Lenny and his girlfriend at the time. We'll call her Sasha. One summer night we were discussing the Ouija board again and I heard from Lenny and Sasha's sister that Sasha's house may be haunted. I was skeptical at first, but Sasha went into detail on the experiences she's had in the house and her sister Tori. They both explained to me that this was all true. So, I decided that if the board would work anywhere, it would have to be there. Lenny and I asked the sisters if we could use the board in their house. They agreed and Lenny and I were very excited to begin. We arrive at the house later that night around 9pm planning to play for only a couple of hours, and little did we know this would last all night. The people present were Lenny and I, Sasha, Tori, and about six to eight of Tori's friends who were all younger than us by at least two or three years. We are all in the basement, and most, if not all of us, are gathered around the table. There are four or five of us with our hands on the planchette, and we start calling out and just moving the planchette around, and we find someone claims to be a child who died in a fire inside the basement we were playing in. It told us its name and age, when it died, etc. I say it because we came to later find out that we truly didn't know what we were communicating with at all. A few minutes later the board goes dead. Nothing. We all took a break and watched some videos on our phones on how to make a board more active after discovering that we didn't have colored candles or any sacrificial lamb, we decided to continue as normal. My friend Lenny is very ballsy when it comes to this kind of stuff, he ended up calling out in the room to whatever was there. He was cursing and throwing insults towards spirits and just overall being very disrespectful and cocky. The rest of the night we all had random encounters with entities. The simple things like I died here or there, or I was this age or that age, etc until we contacted something strong. I say strong because the planchette would move with velocity and smoothness across the board. The air in the room thickened and the hair on the back of my neck actually stood up. After around 10 minutes of talking to this entity, it still wouldn't tell us its name or place of origin. It mentioned that it wasn't born and that it wasn't from Earth. This is something I still think about today. Everything was going fine until Sasha screamed. She screamed with fear and pain in her voice and her screams quickly turned into tears as she stood across the table. Across her upper thigh there were three distinct and somewhat symmetrical claw marks. One of Tori's friends mentioned something about the Holy Trinity and everyone started freaking out. Lenny and I were determined to proceed with the session because neither him nor I were satisfied in our pursuit of true fear. We got back onto the board with Tori and two of her friends. 
Shortly after this, I asked the entity to show me what hell was like. The board spelled out T-O-R-I-C-L-O-S-E-T. We all looked at each other and Tori blurted out, My closet! It spelled Tori Closet. I stared back at everyone in silence until Lenny spoke up by saying, Go into her closet, and you're the only one who asked, so go now and see. At this point, I actually started to feel some real fear. Tori's closet was one of those shoe closets that you'd have to crawl into to go in all the way. I slowly creeped open her bedroom door with Lenny's right hand behind me and looked back as the rest of the group. They stared in anticipation. Lenny shoved me into the dark room from behind and said, I'll hold the door for you just in case. Fine, I replied as I walked over to the closet. I got down on all fours and began to slowly crawl into the closet. That's when I heard a loud thump and felt a bump on the door directly where one of my knees was. I stood up and ran as fast as I could to the door and once I was back into the main basement room, everyone was staring at me. The heck was that? asked Lenny. I was speechless and while I was thinking of a response to Lenny's question, I realized something very disturbing. We are in a basement. So how did the floorboard bump into my knee? What was the loud thumping noise? I headed back to the table and demanded answers to what had just happened. But the board went dead again. No movement. No activity. Nothing. I decided that we should take another break and could process what had just happened. This time Lenny and I went upstairs and Tori as well as a few of her friends stayed in the basement playing with the board. Fifteen minutes later we hear some commotion downstairs and Lenny and I rushed downstairs to see two of Tori's friends on the board. The board was spelling out M-A-M-A-M-A-M-A just over and over again. The whole group decided that we wanted to pursue this strange entity even further instead of just ending the session. This is where the night turns for the worse. After five to ten minutes of messing around and asking questions, we finally asked the question we never should have. Can we see you? The entity told us that it would show itself, but only on one condition. That the two girls who were originally playing after the break went into Sasha's room with the board and in complete darkness. Amazingly, the girls both agreed and they went into the room and shut the door behind them. Lenny looked at me before moving over to the door and grabbing the handle and pulling the door so the girls couldn't get out. Now this was funny at first, but in the next five minutes it was clear that something was deeply wrong. From outside the room we could hear the girls telling the entity to show itself. One of the girls cries out, we can see it. Five seconds after that, there's just screaming, crying, and one of the girls is calling out to the other one with concern and fear in her voice. Sasha yells out, Lenny, open the damn door, and when he does, one of the girls actually falls out. We all pile into the room and see the other girl laying on the bed. We shake her, and she wakes up looking very tired for some reason, like she actually had been sleeping. Five minutes after that, I'm getting ready to drive Sasha and Lenny to his place for the night and head home. The girl from the room was complaining of a headache and was laying on the couch upstairs. On the way to Lenny's house, he asks me to stop at the store so he can get some snacks and drinks, and I agreed to stop along the way. Lenny walks into the store and Sasha stays back in the seat of the car. A moment after Lenny left, Sasha gets a phone call from her sister Tori. Tori was screaming through the phone. I could hear her plain as day sitting next to her. She said that we all need to drive back to the house because there's movie type shit happening. I quickly pulled out of the parking space, barely looking both ways and sped towards the house. Upon arriving at the house, there was no commotion so we were confused. Tori came out and got us and guided us to the couch that the girl was laying on before we left. Tori runs up to us and whispers, Shh, be quiet, Lenny. I was confused and asked what was going on. She told us there was something wrong with her friend. I slowly approached her friend, the girl laying on the L-shaped couch, in a fetal position with her back turned to us. And just as I'm about to extend my arm to touch her back to see if she's awake or not, 
Her whole body starts to contort and twist. She moans loudly and the moans soon turn into growls as I jumped back in shock. I've seen enough movies to make the assumption that she must be possessed. Her friends wanted to call an ambulance, but Lenny and I knew that parents and the police might get involved and it was probably a bad idea. We had to at least perform an exorcism, learn how to do one if possible, or find someone who could. I raced to my house and I grabbed a few things before doing anything else. My parents are Catholic, so we had a cross and a Bible and even some holy water. When I got back to Sasha and Tori's house, I found the girl still on the couch, and I knew we had to move her to the basement. We all held out our arms and made a human bodyboard to carry her on, basically. While we were near the top of the stairs to the basement, she started twisting and contorting again, and most of the other people got scared and dropped her. She was now on the ground near the wall and the oven in the kitchen, and she began having what appeared to be like a seizure. So keep in mind, she has no history of seizures or health problems. She eventually sat up from being sprawled on the floor, resting her back against that oven. She sat there still for a few minutes, and we all just watched, scared to death, scared to approach her. She then began smashing the back of her head against the oven until she just fell over onto her side. And after that, she went back to just laying on the ground. Eventually, we got her into the basement and rested her down on the floor on top of some pillows and blankets to prevent her from hurting herself. This next part is going to sound, well, stupid, but it's the only thing we thought to do. The only thing we could think that might help. Lenny started reading from the Bible while I splashed holy water on her, and the rest of the group just recited her name and some other prayers and things. She tried to bite us. She was screaming in what sounded like tongues, and she was growling. She even scratched at one of her friend's faces. This went on from 12 to at least 3.30 a.m. Eventually, she stopped moving, stopped growling, just stopped everything. Just fell over into a deep sleep. I decided to stay at the house, as... I decided to stay at the house, same as everyone else did, just to make sure things were okay. After falling asleep, I woke up around 4.30 a.m. with a tightness in my chest and a very, very uneasy feeling. I grabbed my keys and ran out to the car and sped home before falling asleep again. When I woke up, I headed back over to their house. Everything was normal and the girl didn't remember a thing. Nothing at all. She had no headache, no memory, just nothing. She was just sore, she said. I forgot to mention that a few people filmed a good part of the incident. We never agreed to show the girl the videos. However, someone sent it to a page on Instagram and it ended up surpassing 100,000 views in a short amount of time. We ended up taking it down. There are issues that I was talking about from the beginning of the post. She found it, lost her mind, and the video had to be taken down. To this day, I haven't talked to her, but I hear she's doing fine. I still don't know much about the M-A-M-A -A -M -A mama. Its origin or agenda still remain a mystery to me. Part of me wants to know more, and another part of me wants nothing to do with it. I've tried to tell this story before, but always just deleted it. But I think I'm okay with sharing it now. When I was about 16, I had an experience that I will never forget. I'm very skeptical, even with the experiences I've had through my life, so even telling this story just still makes it seem surreal. There's a bit of background story, but since I don't want to puke out my life story, let's just say that from a very young age, my life was constantly filled with negativity, and I believe everything that happened before this experience definitely had something to do with it. I was friends with a group of people who practiced Wicca, and it was something I was interested in, so I learned a lot from them before all of this happened. It is a beautiful craft, and so open and welcoming. They were much more experienced, as they had a few years of practicing before I even knew what it was. But anyway, on Halloween, or Sam Hain, we wanted to pay our respects to those who had passed, and so we decided to cast a circle in our local cemetery. 
The circle was cast by an angel statue that had been built for the children buried in the cemetery. Now, normally the door to the circle is closed, but we left it open to invite any spirits to the offerings which were food and drink. My friend Kate went off on her own to speak with someone who had just died a month before. My other friend Meg and I stayed back in the circle, both silent as we did our own thing. I was upset and already at a vulnerable point in my life as I was dealing with depression from the death of my father, who committed suicide when I was six, and I wanted some peace. I wanted to hear from him and understand how he could leave his family like that, how he could leave me like that. I opened the door even wider. It felt like a rush of wind came into the circle and all but knocked Meg over on her butt, basically landing on her black mirror. A black mirror is used for scrying and wicca. It was in her pocket. She broke it, and that means bad luck. She was very spooked by this, but I didn't experience anything. It was completely quiet. She told me to go get Kate, so I stood up and told her to come back to the circle. She was very reluctant, but came back with me. We were all in the circle. Meg told Kate what happened, so we started picking up the food and other things in the middle of the circle so we could officially close it. I can't explain to you what it feels like, but the best way to describe it is like something is invading your space. It's uncomfortable and it's almost like it's trying to shove you out of the way to make room for itself. It literally felt like two different people and the invader was trying to gain control. Meg noticed I looked different and asked if I was okay. I didn't answer. And then I crouched down on the ground, my nails digging in the dirt, and I was swaying back and forth. Before I knew it, I had turned away from them, threw back my head, and I let out a piercing, high-pitched scream that lasted for about 30 seconds. After the scream slowly died off, I started shaking and turned to them. I remember saying, something's wrong, and then they grabbed me by the arms to keep me still and started saying a Wiccan prayer. I tried saying it with them at first, but I literally growled. Before I could finish the sentence, I had no control. I felt hatred and anger, but I kept on trying and eventually I could say it, and I began to feel like a weight had been lifted off me. We closed the circle, went home, and that was that. We didn't talk about it. I laid in bed thinking I would never be in a vulnerable state like that again, that I could be strong. I imagined a white shield surrounding my house and myself. I started working more with energy and stepped away from any type of religion, focusing more on the spiritual, not because I didn't like Wicca, but I knew things had to change. I never told my mom or any of my friends. It was just the two of them and me. Was it demon? Who knows? Some people think demons are only things that can possess, but when a spirit has enough energy, there's a whole lot more they can do. So. It was nothing extravagant, no speaking in tongues or throwing people twice my size across a room. Just something that ended quickly, but changed my life and my perspective forever. I actually did go back to the cemetery the next year with Kate, but nothing happened. We were in my basement hanging out. There were three people in the room. For your sake, I'll just use the names Jake for me. Caleb, and Lucas. Both of these idiots decide that they're going to look up how to summon a succubus. I told him I'd rather him do that at his own house, and that I had enough things to worry about. He took it as a joke, apparently, and muttered some words as he was reading it, then decided to say out loud. Probably isn't a good idea to say this out loud until I understand what it is I'm summoning. But then, like an idiot, goes on to say, oh look, this demon looks creepy, and then he mutters some more words, chanting phrases, and without ever showing the picture of said demon, within seconds my jukebox turned itself on and selected a disc. We all got quiet waiting for it to drop, and the CD started playing. I started to get up and move towards it, as I felt something wrong was taking place. To this day, I don't know what CD it picked or what song it started out with, but the words were, 
protect your life, protect your soul. By now I was already turning it off and I shouted, I do not allow you in my home or anyone inside. I demand you leave immediately and never return. You are not welcome here. Now, I don't believe it was useful as things did start to then fly across my bedroom at speeds requiring them to be thrown with enough force that made them bounce or heavy fans that were angled adjustably falling forward when they were leaning backward. Things just didn't make sense with how much force they were being thrown with. I even had a glass piece completely shatter like basically exploded while sitting still with no one touching it or even remotely close to it. By now, Lucas was curious and told that other idiot to keep going. I immediately snatched the phone and threw it and said if you pick that up and read anything off of it again, I'm going to kick your ass. Get out of my house. And that's basically what happened. We didn't acknowledge it and I made him leave. To this day, we still talk about it, but I keep it short when I'm around them with remarks of, ah, yes, the thing we do not speak of, or, oh, I remember when that didn't happen, which really seems to bother him. My husband was a preacher at the age of 17, and he witnessed an exorcism. That ultimately made him lose his faith. I believe it is attached to him, and this is his story before the demon kills him, if it kills him. Like I said, he used to preach and was involved in an exorcism that involved a young woman. He said that when the demon was there talking, it was trying to rattle their faith and that it did rattle him up enough that he quit preaching immediately after. He said it told him of when he was going to die and ended up trying to kill the woman as it was expelled from her body. He said she was tied to a bed with paramedics present and almost died right there. I fear that it saw him get shaken by it and may have attached to him or brought something else to cloud him over. He is now 29 and his depression was exponentially worse afterward and I can tell you he is just physically and mentally exhausted all the time. We've been together for 9 years in April so I know him well. I honestly believe that I'm his soulmate and he's my soulmate and we both knew this when we first laid eyes on each other. We both agree on this. It's like I recognized his face from a different life. Anyway, his eyes were like a gray, like he was fading out of life how a person would if they were disappearing from a photograph. This demon told him he would not make it to the age of 30, which has him terrified. Just yesterday, he told me he's considering suicide, and I am damn determined to keep my other half not only alive, but make him happy and rid this creature. Anytime we speak about casting this thing out, I can tell it influences him to be apathetic and cloudy about it, so speaking to him about it is very difficult. Six months ago, I believe this creature appeared to him one night when he was driving through the neighborhood across the street, dropping off a friend. The house on the corner had no lights on, but the moon was bright, clear, and full. He said a pale, almost grayish-colored little girl with a black no face, like the eyes and features were just melting down, he said she was standing on the porch staring at him as he drove by and around the corner. I have always felt a heavy presence in this neighborhood, but as of late, nothing. I believe that he saw it. Basically what he looked like was the long time explanation of he looks like he's seen a ghost. So please help me. I don't know what this thing is or what to do about it or how to get it expelled from him. He deserves happiness. He is kind. He was a preacher after all. So he's a very understanding, patient man that loves people and, and it's not fair or right that he's about to give up his life. I can't help him, but perhaps somebody out there can.